Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God on this glorious day as this couple come and exchange vows together on their wedding day. Oh, you've just uh, just caught me. Just uh, practicing. Lockdown's easy. You never know. Make it a, a flood of weddings coming my way. Haven't done much in the last 18 months. Commitment. It's what marriage is all about. Commitment's not a great word currently in our day and our generation. Not many people are committed to relationships. You just move on if it's not working very well. If things are, are going tough, well then let's just call it a day. But when we look at the Bible, we see a different view. We see something completely different when the Bible talks about commitment. And that's what we're going to be looking at today as we continue our series, Where Do We Grow From Here, New Life Church? Today, we're looking at commitment and seeing how God wants to challenge us. See where we grow from here. So, what are you reckon, you two? Should we carry on with the rest of the service? Yep. Yeah? Okay. God bless you as you join us together for our service.
You might guess from the cards, I had a birthday this week. There is a common theme. I'm getting older. I need to go clubbing while I can. But, uh, open it quick before you don't have any energy left to open your card. But one card struck me this week when it came to our service. This one. Go big or go home. It's the same with commitment. You can either go big on commitment we can go home, give up, lie on the sofa and say, too much like hard work. As lockdown eases, as we get back to being a church family, can I encourage every single one of you to just go big. By the way, it cost two pound, didn't take the price off. Ah.
Father, would you come and bless our nation at this time? Father, as we start to ease out of lockdown, Father, would you come? Would you bless this land? Not that we deserve it, but because you are a God of grace and you're a God of mercy. Father, we pray for those that work within the NHS. Father, would you give them strength? Father, would you just help them to carry on loving, to carry on giving, to carry on ministering? Father, as they've done this for many, many months, Father, would you bless the doctors? Would you bless the nurses? Would you bless every single person, whatever their role, whatever their position is, would you bless them? And Father, I pray that your hand would be upon this nation. That you would protect us. Father, we are saddened by the numbers going up. We're saddened by the amount of death that there's been in this land. Father, would you come? Would you come and bring healing on our land? Father, for those in power, would you give them wisdom? For the MPs, for the scientists, Father, I pray that they would listen to each other. Father, I pray that you'd give them sound advice. And Father, that they would give us sound advice. And Father... For each and every church in the land, Father, may they just be centres of blessing, centres of love, centres of, of mercy. Father, would you come? May your church rise up at this time, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Today we continue our series of talks under the title, Where Do We Grow From Here? by looking together at commitment. We've looked at spiritual growth and community in the first two weeks. And today, I'd like us to look at commitment from four aspects. Firstly, the commitment of Jesus to us, and then our commitment to him, followed by our commitment to each other within the church family. And then finally, our commitment to a world which needs to hear that Jesus died for everyone, for the things we do wrong, that he rose and lives in all who believe on him through the Holy Spirit. Firstly then we look at the commitment of Jesus to us. We must never, never underestimate the cost to Jesus of leaving heaven as it were, to live a life of obedience to Father's will, to show us a pattern of how our lives should be. Jesus is the only answer to man's problems and he knew what had to be done. We can search and search for more and more knowledge about this, that and the other because we're so smart, we're so clever. Well, of course we are. We're made in the image of God. But we will never find any other answer to the world's problems than that in our Saviour, Jesus we share his anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays to Father, Your will, not mine, be done. To the extent he sweated blood, a sure sign of the pain which he saw on the road he had to travel, to the cross and beyond. What a saviour! What a saviour! Later on we share communion together, which simply and powerfully summarises Jesus' commitment to all his followers, present and future. That's us, you know. And he says beautiful words to his friends at the time of that last supper. We read in Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, where Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He loves it when we share communion as a sign of our love for him, a sign of our love, one for another, and because he told us to do it. Jesus was once asked by a member of the Jewish ruling community at the time, a man called Nicodemus, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? This is in John's ch uh, Gospel, chapter 3, if you want to read more, verses 1 to 21. Basically, the answer Jesus gave was to believe in him. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he would be lifted up, pointing to his crucifixion and death, bringing light into the darkness. Jesus says later on that he is the light of the world. 
I love light, don't you? I love to get up in the morning and pull open the curtains and let the light in. Things that are unclear are made clear through Jesus who lives in each of us through his Holy Spirit. There's no hiding from him, you know, because he's the light. Now, I find that comforting, really, that I don't have to lie. I don't have to pretend. Actually, I can just be me and hopefully seek to be that person that he meant me to be. Jesus, the good shepherd. He tells of a parable of a good shepherd who leaves the flock to go and find and rescue the one who has gone astray. He spoke of his commitment to seek out the lost sheep and represents a powerful challenge to us, his followers. We also have another parable, a lovely parable, about the wayward son who leaves father, family and home to go off into the world to do it his way. And the father, we're told, is constantly looking out for the return of this unworthy son who finally comes to his senses and returns. Father runs to him, embraces him and rejoices on his return. Could there be a more powerful picture of a loving heavenly father and of his commitment to us each one? Jesus is totally truthful, totally trustworthy and faithful to us. He keeps his words. I will never leave you, he says. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the good shepherd. Shepherd, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. And I will send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Those whom he sets free are free indeed. And he gives many more promises for us to live in and live through and to take on board in our lives. So then, what is our response? What should our commitment be? God gives us freedom. Man has since Adam been given free choice. What represents good choices? Following Jesus is a pretty good choice. Actually, it's the best. Come and see, Jesus said to early seekers. And it's the same today. Come and see. This is a life-changing relationship for anyone who chooses to follow Jesus. They will never be the same again. And we know with confidence that he always wants what's best for us, even when we can't see it at the time. God's life manual, the Bible, speaks clearly about who God is. And the responses of many people through time and lessons to be learned are recorded therein. And personally, I've read the Bible many times now and continually I come across passages and I think I've never read that before. I've also read passages at times which were absolutely relevant to my situation with that particular set of circumstances. He spoke right into it. And actually, that's not surprising because you see, the Bible is the living word. And through the Holy Spirit, we are spoken to through our various circumstances. And God knows what is going to happen before it does. An awesome experience. And I'm sure many of you have experienced just the same thing. In response to the indwelling Holy Spirit, we receive a deeper revelation of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who together seek to bless us as the one God they are. And Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would tell them more about him. So a vital part of our response is to read the Bible and expect to receive greater revelation and an ever-deepening relationship as we act upon the words we read. Yes, that word relationship is so important and needs to be tended to so that it can flourish in us. Now let me ask a question. Does anyone have a relationship with someone with whom they don't communicate? It has to be two-way, doesn't it? 
I just think that if Jesus needed to get away and talk to the Father, then that is a vital part of our commitment too, if we really want to grow from here. As with Jesus, who found the right times and places that work for him, then we need to find what works best for us, the most effective places to meet that enable us to speak to and hear from God. Well, I admit to you, I'm easily distracted, so I have to work a bit harder on sitting and listening and find that so often I may not hear immediately, but later on thoughts, which I know are not exactly mine, but come from God, come to me to prompt and to encourage or otherwise instruct me. Prayer, you see, is a vital part of our commitment, of our relationship. Then there's worship too, of course. That's so important. In Romans chapter 12, we hear from Paul, the apostle, urging brothers and sisters to offer themselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He loves our worship, which I guess arises from an overflow of our gratitude for all that he's done, is doing and will do. Well, if you are alive and you're alive all the time, I guess that means that we have to be prepared to offer worship all of the time as living sacrifices. So this attitude of continual continue worship will show itself in our demeanour and be a testimony that others can see. Jesus in us, looking outwards. And Jesus speaks clearly about the work of the Holy Spirit and elsewhere we read of various aspects of his ministry. His role is to bring us to receive him, that's Jesus, and go out in Jesus' name, full of power and full of the Holy Spirit, energising every aspect of our lives. And I suppose that we could say that he is the expression of Jesus in and through us. And then we read in the words of John chapter 15 and verse 26 what Jesus has to say about the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he'll testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning, says Jesus. Well, he doesn't stop challenging us, does he? We read again in John and chapter 15 and verse 12, Jesus' command to love one another as I have loved you. Well, I could say that's a big ask. And it's vital because our unity in community speaks volumes to the society in which we live today. I've even heard it said of people that they want a bit of that for themselves. They want to share and be cared for in that kind of society. So then on to our commitment, one to another. I guess the key there is to do those things and act in such a way as to build each other up. Well, this is how the early church did it. We've read in previous weeks, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, which in summary says that they devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, holy communion, and they had everything in common. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Well, how's that for commitment? Well, we do have to realise that we live in different times, but that sense of caring for one another is still so very, very important today. Even more so, many say, where communication becomes more difficult. Our commitment to meet together in groups of various shapes and sizes enables us to grow together, to understand one another as we listen and share from our daily lives. We can become proper friends, united in the Holy Spirit. We're also exhorted to pray for one another in our quiet times, in those corporate times, as prompted. And this may lead to contacting people in times of particular need as the Holy Spirit directs. You see, 
He knows people's circumstances. And I bet I'm not the only one who has been surprised on making a phone call to hear the words from a person, how did you know? How did you know that I was in need to hear at this time? What an awesome experience that is. If we're honest, however, being community doesn't come easy. But we have the Bible's help to understand more. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ, which is very succinctly recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 12 onwards, where it speaks of the diversity within the body. Some bits working closely together and others at either end of the body. But the point is, all are working for the benefit of the whole, but with vitally different roles. We need to see the qualities in each other and we need to encourage one another in those qualities. Different picture we read in 1 Peter chapter 2. We read of living stones being built into a spiritual house. Helpfully, if you've been on the beach, you'll see that no two stones are alike. Some are lovely and smooth and round and some are rough and ready. And some are even sharp, where they're perhaps flints that have been split. A diversity of colour and of shapes is what we see. But being built, we're told, into a spiritual house, built on Jesus, the living stone, is the work of the Holy Spirit. He brings unity where we don't find it easy to fit together. He flows be between us, between those bricks, as it were, between those stones. Our commitment to love one another is the key to overcoming the challenges, bringing the unity through caring more for others, getting to really understand each other, looking for the best, recognising our differences, looking to encourage, in fact. The verses in 1 Corinthians and chapter 13 speak powerfully about an attitude of love and was for the church in Corinth, which had its own problems. There's much written in the Bible about how we should work out living together as the Lord's community. But again, we look to the Apostle Paul to give us clear direction, showing a full understanding of how difficult this can be. In Romans chapter 4 verses 1 to 8, he says, Accept the weak in faith. Don't dispute aggressively. Don't become contentious about eating habits. And don't judge and so on, because we all belong to the Lord, but we are different. He knows and helps us to know and understand each other if we listen to him, if we see each other through his eyes, and if we help each other with his hands. And so then we've looked at the commitment of Jesus to the church, his body. We've looked at the commitment of the body in partnership with Jesus. And we've looked at our commitment to one another to grow together in diversity. And so now we must look at how we meet the final challenge of Jesus. To go and make disciples, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. That great challenge of Jesus I guess in many ways we could say, yes, that's what it's all about. Well, we're told by Jesus that we are to be in the world, but not of it. Well, what does that mean? Well, a look at Jesus' way of life, as told in the Gospels, gives us a clue. When we read of the many different groups of people and individuals too, we know that Jesus was very much in the world. He was a challenging and very special man who was concerned for those with whom he came into contact with. You could say he had a passion for people. He was a good listener, gave very wise, inspired answers and examples when faced sometimes with very, very awkward questions. And he attracted men, we mustn't forget that, as well as the ladies in his team who supported 
his ministry enormously, as we read in the Bible. Yes, we see that he was very much part of the world, but he never, never compromised godly values, and nor must we. In fact, there were a number of cases where godly values had been distorted by the leaders of the society, and Jesus spoke some of the strongest words to these leaders. He held strongly to what may be called kingdom values. And you know something? Those values are for our benefit, for the benefit of our society today. Significantly, I would suggest. And they contribute to our quality of life. They're totally good, as difficult as it may be, to work some of these values out in our society today. They are there, however, to be upheld by the followers of Jesus as part of our commitment. How does this commitment look for you and I today? Let me share with you some observations. Be in the world. We mix with neighbours, friends, family, with those who share activities with us and casual encounters, i.e. the supermarket queue and cashier. Pray for opportunity and be always alert. There were quite a number of people involved in my particular journey to follow Jesus. And who knows what would have happened had any one of them not said yes to the opportunity to speak and share with me. Well, my thanks to all of those people involved in my journey. Be a person of prayer for others. Pray intentionally for them. Encounters that you will see opportunities are what we pray for. That you'll listen carefully and prayerfully and bring words of blessing into people's situations. Remember that you are part of the Lord's army. There are others too to pick up the baton where you leave off. That's all a part of being in the body of Christ. So don't be disappointed if someone doesn't immediately say yes to Jesus. That might be the role of someone else, as in my own experience. What I would say also is be you. Be prepared to tell your personal story, ready to adapt it to the listener. Some of us are very sensitive to the needs of others and express that by giving little gifts, sending a card, providing hospitality and helps. Pray that the Holy Spirit will show you how to best express yourself to others so that you may bring the love of Jesus to them. Be a community of integrity. Well, what does that mean? Basically, to be who we claim to be and work for our unity as a priority. Work for the unity in community that others may see it and want it. Acts 2 verse 47 tells us that the body of believers praised God and enjoyed the favour of all people and the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Is that not our heartfelt prayer? Is that not where our passion lies? So we conclude by asking ourselves, where is your passion? Where is our passion? Where is our commitment? And how do we best express our love for Jesus to others? May I leave those challenges with you.
So, Father, as we come to the end of our service, may we search our hearts and our minds, may we think about our commitment, our commitment to you, our commitment to each other. Father, would you challenge us through the words of Paul? Father, just in the next couple of days, as we think about, as we reflect on the service, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and speak to every single one of us, that we just may live out your gospel, that we may share your gospel, that we may kind of be an answer to prayer, that we may be the only Bible that somebody reads this week. Father, would you just anoint us and use us for your fame, for your honour, for your glory, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, it's time for Zoom refreshments because it's half eleven. Our service is over. Great thing about having a birthday is when you come to Zoom Refreshments, what are you going to have? This chocolate. This chocolate. Oh yes, this chocolate. See you at half eleven. I'll share my chocolates, but it's digital, so I can't pass them round. Ho hum. <laughs>